Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality factors that may be at work with Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold. These are the two assailants that executed the Columbine shooting in 1999. So just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. So first I'll take a look at the timeline of the Columbine massacre, then look at the mental health and personality factors that may be involved, and look at the motive. So what was the motive for Eric and Dylan? Starting with the timeline, we go to April 20, 1999 in Littleton, Colorado, Columbine High School. Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, both seniors, prepared to carry out an attack. 11.10 a.m., they both drive in separately and park in different parking lots. As Harris walks toward the school, he encounters a student. He tells that student to leave because he likes him. About 11.15 a.m., they enter the cafeteria carrying duffel bags full of explosives. They have a timer set to go off at 11.17 a.m. They chose this time because they believed that would lead to a maximum number of casualties. After this, they go out to their cars and wait. 11.19 a.m., a diversionary explosive device detonates in a field about three miles to the southwest of the high school, causing a citizen to call the police. This was done to distract law enforcement. Shortly afterward, witnesses spotted Eric and Dylan by the west exterior steps and heard one of them say, go, go. So evidently, Eric and Dylan realized that the explosives they planted in the cafeteria were not going to detonate. So those bombs failed to go off, so now they were going to start with the shooting. They each pulled a shotgun from one of the bags, and over the next few minutes, they shot several students. Some were wounded, and others were killed. During this time, they were also throwing explosive devices, some of which detonated, and others did not. During the attack, Eric and Dylan switched back and forth between weapons. Eric had a pump-action shotgun, and a 9mm carbine. So a weapon chambered in 9mm Luger, sometimes referred to as 9mm Parabellum. Dylan was carrying a double barrel shotgun and a Tech 9, which is a semi-automatic pistol also chambered for 9mm Luger. Witnesses hear one of the pair saying, this is what we always wanted to do, this is awesome. So we see a sadistic component here early in the shooting. 11.22 a.m. A custodian calls Deputy Neil Gardner. He says he's needed in the back lot. One minute later, a 911 call is placed, and there is a report of a girl injured in the south lower parking lot. Deputy Gardner hears another deputy being advised on that call and activates his lights and siren. At this point, Eric and Dylan shoot at a teacher and a student by the west entrance. They're injured by glass and metal fragments. Deputy Gardner arrives just as the teacher and the student are fleeing. Eric engages the deputy, firing 10 shots at him before his weapon jams. Gardner fires four shots from his Glock 21, a 45 caliber semi-automatic pistol. Harris spins to his right, so Gardner believes that he hit him, but then Harris starts firing again. Then he enters the school through the west doors. Deputy Gardner does not pursue him. Another deputy approached Gardner just as Eric was going back in the school. That deputy fired three rounds at Eric and missed. We now see Eric and Dylan continue to move through the school and fire at students and teachers. Witnesses would report that the two were laughing. The pair makes their way to the library. As they're moving there, they're firing randomly and throwing pipe bombs. This lasts for about three minutes. No one was hit during this period of time. It is now about 11.29 a.m. Eric and Dylan wound a student and kill another. Then they shoot out of the windows at the police. The police return fire. At this point, Eric and Dylan started shooting students in the library. The shooting lasts until 11.36 a.m. They would kill 10 more students and wound another 12. Now we see Eric and Dylan start moving through the school, looking in rooms, but they don't appear interested in gaining entry into those rooms. They throw several more pipe bombs. They make their way to the cafeteria, where Harris attempts to detonate propane bombs by shooting them. They manage to partially detonate one of the bombs, but for the most part, their bombs really weren't that successful. Many of them failed to detonate. At 11.52 a.m., the SWAT team gets permission to enter the school. Eric and Dylan leave the cafeteria 
for the library at noon. A few minutes later, the police lay down suppressing fire into the windows of the library. At 12.08 p.m., Eric and Dylan commit suicide. It wasn't until after 4 p.m. that all the survivors were evacuated. 13 were murdered, 12 students and one teacher, and 24 were wounded. So, moving to the cultural significance before I get to the mental health and personality factors, I think this gives some context as to the impact of this shooting. This was the deadliest school rampage shooting in history at that time. It was the second most covered emergent news story of the 1990s. The O.J. Simpson case was number one. These two were media savvy. We see that Eric had a website. He talked about who he hated. He talked about acts of vandalism he had committed. We see the pair record themselves shooting. They made a film where they were hitmen hired by a bully to kill an athlete. And then there are, of course, these so-called basement tapes that they made. They talked about a revolution where they would get back at students who bullied other students. Now moving to the mental health and personality factors. Eric and Dylan's plan was to kill 500 students. They wrote a lot in the time preceding the attack. We see a lot of indications from these writings about their mental health. Interestingly, the two did not consume illicit substances. Eric was on an antidepressant that he was prescribed, called Luvox. They did not come from a broken home. There was no trauma history. They did seem to understand the impact of what they were doing. They carried out this action because of that impact. They knew how destructive they were going to be, and that's what they wanted. Now, specifically with Eric Harris, he was described as bright, sensitive. He could be personable. Some considered him attractive. He tended to behave in the classroom. He didn't stand out as a troublemaker in that venue. He would meet Dylan when he was in the seventh grade. Eric was described as depressed, self-conscious, so he was aware how others saw him, and an individual who wanted recognition. After he was arrested for stealing electronics from a van in 1998, he was diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder and started on psychotropic medication. Now, the FBI has said that Eric was an out-of-control psychopath, and there is evidence to support this. We see the parents of an on-again, off-again girlfriend complained in 1997 and 1998 about both Eric and Dylan, but they appeared to emphasize Eric's behavior a bit more. They said he went on violent rants on the internet and threatened to blow up buildings with pipe bombs. An affidavit was completed by the police for a search warrant. The police never took that to a judge. This information was hidden until two years after the attack, demonstrating that the law enforcement here in this area was capable of keeping secrets, which makes me wonder how many other people were capable of keeping secrets in this situation. For example, the faculty and staff at the school. We see that Eric started a list of people he wanted to harm. On the list were males who insulted him and females who had rejected him. He made statements like he would love to kill all the residents of Denver, Colorado. He was described as evil, dark, weird, negative. He thought of himself as schizophrenic, clearly not understanding what's involved in that disorder. He described himself as a victim, but he was also a perpetrator. He was a good student, but angry and hostile when he was in school. He said he was full of hate, and he loved being that way. Eric fooled many people. We see this example with Eric's father, Wayne. Wayne would pick up the telephone, and on the other end, there was a gun shop owner who said the ammunition that was ordered was ready to be picked up. Wayne just told the gun shop owner that he had not ordered any ammunition, and he hung up the phone. He didn't ask any questions about who ordered the ammunition. Many times, Eric is described as a criminal mastermind, but he was not always careful. He openly discussed a desire to blow up the school, and he took a pipe bomb to work to show his co-workers. There were actually many warning signs that Eric was dangerous. He had an obsession with explosives, and this was a frequent topic of his conversations with fellow students. He also had an obsession with women, specifically being rejected by women. He had a number of sexual fantasies that he wrote about, and many of them involved violence and dominance. We see a number of indications of narcissism. He said he wanted to leave an impression on the world. Now, moving to Dylan. Dylan wrote somewhat, but not as much as Harris. Dylan's parents have been described as lacking warmth and affection, and we see that Dylan frequently fought with his older brother. He was described as depressed. We see there were instances of self-harm, specifically cutting. He was insecure, immature, clumsy, 
unkempt, and shy. A teacher described him as unattractive and a slacker, so they were being fairly straightforward there. He was rejected by his peers frequently. We see Dylan had an interest in Charles Manson. Dylan may have been bisexual, but there's no evidence of any sexual activity. And he had fantasies about being dominant and avenging the wrongs that were done to him. We see closer to the attack that he was losing interest in school. He became moody, irritable, withdrawn. He talked about how he did not have a girlfriend. He felt unloved. Yet at the same time, he seemed to be looking forward to the future. For example, he was applying to colleges. In his junior year, we see that Dylan hacks into a computer and he's arrested for stealing from that van, the same incident that Eric was involved in. When he was confronted about his behavior, he evidently had a cold reaction. There was no acceptance of responsibility. But something was clearly wrong, so we see yet another warning sign that's missed. During the attack, a friend asked Dylan what he was doing, and Dylan responded, oh, just killing people. Dylan did not kill that particular student. So if we look at both Eric and Dylan, we see some commonalities. Both were depressed. Both were outcasts. Both had fantasies, including ones of a sexual nature. They both had limited social skills, and they were both disliked. They believed that they had ascended to a higher level of consciousness, so they put themselves above other people, kind of bordering on a shared delusion. Eric Harris did appear to be a psychopath. He had no empathy whatsoever. He enjoyed killing. His mission was to end life. I think he would have been satisfied if he had survived. He had talked about escape plans, but he was also satisfied to end his life. He fired more rounds than Dylan. Eric was fearless. He was in a firefight with Deputy Gardner. I can't imagine that Eric had ever been in a firefight before, yet he seemed to keep things together in that combat. He fired at the deputy two separate times. So even with his weapon jamming, he cleared the action, chambered around, and continued firing. So again, he seems quite collected for being in a situation that's so stressful that he'd never been in before. We see a number of grandiose narcissistic characteristics with Eric. In terms of Dylan Klebold, we see he was also depressed. His mission was to end his pain. He had almost no empathy, but we see some signs of it. He was confused about who he was. He seems to have a number of vulnerable narcissistic traits. So in terms of the mental health alignment with their behavior, we see an alignment for Eric with antisocial personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder. It's also possible he had obsessive compulsive disorder. He may have had some obsessive compulsive personality features. He could have also had something like major depressive disorder or some other disorder involving depression. And there have been theories that he may have had features of paranoid personality. I think this is possible. He did seem to hold a grudge against a number of people. Looking at Dylan Klebold, we see his behavior also aligns with antisocial personality disorder. He seems to have depression, and some have theorized that he had schizotypal personality features. That disorder involves odd beliefs, magical thinking, ideas of reference, and excessive social anxiety. So that's certainly a possibility. So now moving to their personality profiles, I conceptualize personality using the five-factor model. I remember the five traits through the acronym OCEAN, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So I'll look at Eric and then Dylan for each of the traits. So with openness to experience, we see Eric is high in this trait, and Dylan is also high in the trait, but lower than Eric. As far as conscientiousness, we see that Eric is mid to high. He did plan a lot, and again, he was a good student. And with Dylan, we see low conscientiousness. He was a poor student and tended to act impulsively. With extroversion, we see mid-range extroversion for Eric and low extroversion for Dylan. So he was introverted. Both of them were low in agreeableness, but Eric was lower on that trait. And in terms of neuroticism, we see Eric was very low in neuroticism, and Dylan was somewhat high with that trait. So now looking at the dark tetrad, so this would be psychopathy, narcissism, Machiavellianism, and sadism. With psychopathy, we see that Eric seems to have more traits from factor one. So he's callous, unemotional, 
lacks empathy, fails to accept responsibility, and he's also grandiose and manipulative. We see that Dylan appears higher on factor two psychopathy. He's impulsive and irresponsible. Eric is more psychopathic overall when looking at his behavior. So he was the more pronounced psychopath of this pair. As far as narcissism, we see that Eric has grandiose narcissism, like I talked about, and Dylan has vulnerable narcissism. Looking at Machiavellianism, Eric was high in Machiavellianism, he was cynical, and he had planning skills. He planned this attack for a long time. Dylan had some of that. He helped plan the attack, but he was more mid-range with Machiavellianism. As far as sadism, we see that Eric was extremely sadistic, and Dylan was fairly high in that trait as well. So I see this question sometimes about Eric and Dylan. Did they need each other for this attack to happen? Well, I think the answer is maybe. I think Eric could have done this alone and may have done it alone. I don't think Dylan could have done it alone, right? So in a sense, Dylan needed Eric, but I don't think Eric actually needed Dylan. So what about their motive for this attack? Well, we see during the attack, they were asked, why are you doing this? And they answered they always wanted to do this. This was payback. They've dreamed of doing it for years. In their minds, the victims deserved what they were doing. So let me look at a few different motives here. These are motives that have been discussed quite a bit. We see this motive based on the trench coat mafia. So this was essentially a group of students who wore trench coats. They tended to be outcasts. It appears that Eric and Dylan knew members of this group, but were not really officially part of it. So I don't think this was really part of the motive. We also see this theory about rock and roll music and violent video games. This may have been a way for the pair to express feelings and thoughts that they had, but I doubt that these items actually caused them to be criminals. We also see this discussion around their lack of values. They just didn't have good values. I suppose that's a possibility, but we see a wide range of values with different people, and very few people go on to be murderers. There's been a lot of discussion about bullying, harassment, intimidation, and alienation. And it's interesting because I think people are sharply divided on this point. The faculty and the staff adamantly deny that there was any type of excessive bullying or harassment in the school. Yet we see quite a bit of evidence indicating there was. So I really sense some denial on this. I think this was actually part of it. I don't know if it was the majority contributor, but I think it was something that factored into their thinking. They really did seem to want to exact revenge. Another possible motive would be their hatred for other races and religious groups. I think this was part of it as well. And this brings us to the idea of mental illness. We do see pathological personality traits, but I don't really think they had psychosis. So I see this as more of a personality issue as opposed to a true thought disorder, some disorder that involves reality testing. Some of the behavior is odd and unusual, but I don't think it really rises to the level of delusional. So we're really left with a lot of personality disturbances. And I think a big part of it was really the narcissistic fantasy. They had all these fantasies they kept investing in. And eventually they tried to live out several of these fantasies. So I think the mental health factors, especially the personality factors, really were a significant part of the motive. Some other interesting factors in this situation, the Columbine massacre, we see a number of people really didn't know that what these two were doing was an attack, right? We see that classmates thought this was a prank. Other people thought they were carrying paintball guns. There was a teacher who thought the guns were toys and she was actually gonna approach them and tell them to knock it off. So we see just a high level of disbelief, right? Nobody really expected these two to do something like this, even though there were clear warning signs for some people. I mentioned before the shootout between Eric and Deputy Gardner. Many people have been critical of the deputy for not shooting Eric Harris. We see at one point later on that Eric fired a shotgun with one hand and the recoil brought the shotgun up into his nose, breaking it. So this doesn't really indicate he had a lot of experience with firearms. He was fearless, but it's really unlikely he would have been an effective combatant against an armed law enforcement officer. The problem here, I think, was really that this officer wasn't prepared for the situation and the distance at which the confrontation occurred. Deputy Gardner was carrying a Glock 21. This is chambered for 45 caliber ACP, automatic Colt pistol. It carries 13 rounds in the magazine and one in the chamber. 
I'm going to assume the Deputy Gardner had around in the chamber when his weapon was holstered, and that he had two other magazines. So here we see he had 40 rounds total. So he had to think about managing his ammunition as well as hitting the target. Now, he was 180 feet away from Eric when he fired those four shots. So the bullet drop at that distance was around three to four inches. Certainly somebody with the right training could have hit Eric at that distance. Now, training usually involves silhouettes, and of course Eric was firing back. So that's important to keep in mind too. Silhouettes typically don't shoot back. If they do, it's probably time to switch to another range. Now, I doubt that Deputy Gardner had much training past 50 feet with that weapon. Most officer-involved shootings are 21 feet or closer. So I don't think he was prepared for that specific type of combat. Now, the other factor, of course, is why didn't he follow Eric back inside the building? That really, I think, was a key mistake. And I think he was just following procedure that we saw at that time. Now, if he had gone to the building, he really would have leveled the playing field. Now, Eric was carrying a 9mm carbine, which would be more accurate than a Glock 21 because of the longer barrel with the carbine. But if Deputy Gardner had entered the building, he could have leveled the playing field a bit. He would have closed the distance. And at a closer distance, the Glock 21 is actually a pretty good weapon, right? That's a good weapon for those circumstances. Now, looking back, of course, it's easy to say he should have gone in, and procedures have changed. But that was really one of the reasons that Eric and Dylan were able to get away. None of those officers went into the building and directly confronted them. They pretty much did what they wanted until the point where they ended their own lives. So the law enforcement response was disastrous, and Eric and Dylan exposed serious flaws in the tactics of that time. This wasn't a hostage situation where the assailants wanted a ransom and a plane, some type of escape plan. Their plan was to die. So from their point of view, they had nothing to lose. Law enforcement response must be appropriately aggressive in those situations. So those are my thoughts on Eric Harris, Dylan Klebold, and the Combine Massacre. If you enjoyed this content, please subscribe to my channel and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.